incredible study that um, was that of the NIH uh, in Bethesda. A good friend of mine, Rafael de Cabo, and his lab had over 10,000 mice. They put them on different diets, different carbs, protein, fat. And they, they then divided those diets into two groups. Some mice got food all the time and they nibbled on it during the day. And then the others got the meal once. I think it was for an hour only. And those mice gorged themselves and, and ate almost as much as the ones that were grazing. And it didn't matter what the food was. It was the ones that ate in that window that lived dramatically longer. So if you can extrapolate, and there's always caveats, but I think the principle still holds in ourselves, which is it's not as much about what you're eating, but when you're eating. And it is confusing because, first of all, we're all different. We have different levels of willpower. We have different jobs. Some of us are hungry in the morning. Some are hungry at night. Um, some of us can go for three days. I can't, but some people can. Some can go for just a, you know, the morning. Plus, we're all genetically different. We all have different microbiomes and food preferences. So it is complicated, but I, I found it relatively simple to explain it this way. If you are not starving at breakfast and you prefer dinner, skip breakfast. And if you can do without dinner, skip dinner. But skip one of those two because then you have a whole period of sleep that uh, means you're fasting and your body will protect itself and repair itself better. Now you can take it one step further if you're game. Uh, and that's what I did over the last um, 18 months during the pandemic, was to also, as best I can, skip lunch as well. So I go all day without eating with a tiny little bit of yogurt in the morning to dissolve a supplement. But essentially I'm just, uh, here I'm holding a glass of water, I'll have tea, I'll have coffee, that'll keep me full. Um, and I go till dinner and at dinner I have a reasonable meal. I'll go out to a restaurant and I'll eat something and try not to be full. I don't stuff myself because I'll actually sleep poorly. Um, but I, I, I really enjoy that. And first of all, it saves money. Second of all, it makes you enjoy food a lot more. And third, there's a misconception that you'll feel tired. It's totally wrong. If you can get through three to four weeks of that with some willpower and, uh, and a bit of uh, hot beverage, a few hot beverages, you'll actually get your body will get accustomed to it to the point where eating lunch feels weird and you definitely don't need it and you definitely don't feel tired. And I don't get that afternoon slump, which I know is caused by uh, a, a decrease in insulin after a lunchtime meal. And I've never felt better. I've never looked better. I've never had so much energy physically and mentally. Intermittent fasting now is the most popular diet in the world. And it, uh, it, hopefully it's not a fad because this is probably the most effective diet that's ever been promoted in, on the planet. Um, even for children, I'm not suggesting malnutrition or starvation by any means, but having three meals a day plus snacks uh, is a calorie overload for even for children in the most case. And you can tell just by the amount of fat a kid is carrying as to whether you're overfeeding your kid and if you're if you have an obese child and i know it's very difficult because in my family we struggle with this as well but the effects on that child will echo for decades perhaps even towards the end of life they will still have the memory the epigenetic memory we call it of having been obese as a child and so one area that i'm researching and going to be communicating about is the effects of our lifestyle, not just on adults and the elderly, but even on children. It's essentially just eat less often. That's how simple it is. Skip a meal, skip the snacks. Um, so intermittent fasting, time-restricted feeding, uh, to me, it's all the same thing. It's just uh, don't keep your body filled with food. That's pretty simple. Um, the amount of hours, the more you can spread it out. So 18 for me is, is a good, good number. Um, 16 is okay. Um, you know, I, I eat within two hours, so I, I get basically 22 hours, which works for me. 
Uh, but here's the, the, the really important point. Um, it's not complicated. You do what you can. You start skipping meals. Start with one, dinner or breakfast. And then if you can do that, then try to go longer. Um, it's not, the, the other really important thing is if you try to do what I do from a standing start, you will fail. There's no question. It's too hard. Your body will freak out. It'll feel tired. Your brain will be distracted uh, and you'll go straight to the fridge. You need to give yourself time. It can take a month to get there. And one of the adaptations is your liver needs to learn to put out glucose to maintain steady levels. So it's not like this through the day. And, and that takes, it takes a while. Uh, but once you're at the state that I'm in and your microbiome is optimized and your liver is very happy with its existence, then you, you will find it very hard to go back to eating the old way. Um, and you also generally look a lot better as well, which is a nice side effect. Well, there are nine known causes of aging. There's a, there's a lot of them. I won't list them all. What controls those processes are these three main longevity pathways. So sirtuins do a lot of things. They protect the cell from damage. They repair things. They reduce inflammation, um, even boost memory. So they're, they're very, very important for long-term health. And they are, they are boosted by a molecule called NAD. And so we've been... Uh, adding an NMN, which is a precursor to NAD, to the water supply of mice for many years, uh, and they're healthier and they live longer. The other, let's call it another central pathway is called mTOR, little m, capital T, O, R. And it has uh, evolved to sense protein intake primarily, amino acids. And so we, when you eat a lot of meat and a lot of uh, particularly branched chain amino acids, they're called, that are in meat, you uh, will stimulate this mTOR. Now, the problem is mTOR is a signal for growth rather than survival. And so that's why if you eat a lot, a lot of meat, you're not actually going, in my view, to stimulate your longevity. The other way around, when you're fasting and you don't have a lot of amino acids coming into your stomach, then mTOR will be shut down. And that's a hunker down survival mechanism. Uh, and there's a drug called rapamycin that currently is used for immunosuppression, but in low doses, it inhibits mTOR and extends the lifespan of just about every organism that it's been fed to. And there are some people taking it for longevity. And then the third pillar is called AMPK. And AMPK registers the amount of energy in the body, uh, sugar, for example. And when its sugar levels are low and insulin levels are low, then AMPK will be boosted in, into uh, activity, boosted activity. And then the result is more mitochondria and less inflammation. So you want more sirtuins, less mTOR, and more AMP, AMPK. Now, the AMPK is interesting. You can take a drug called metformin, which will boost AMPK. Now, metformin in the West is uh, UK and in America is uh, prescription only. It's not true for most of the world. Uh, but there are people who are taking it instead of for type 2 diabetes, which is what it's normally prescribed for, to lower blood sugar, just to take it as a preventative measure. But what's interesting is that there are tens of thousands of people that have been looked at, and they also have lower risk of other diseases when they take metformin, cancer, heart disease, Alzheimer's, frailty. And it's a fact that people that take metformin daily have longer lives than those that don't even take the drug or have type 2 diabetes. Um, and so together, we've got those three levers that we can pull, um, along with exercise and, and intermittent fasting, um, that we think will greatly lengthen our lives by 15, 20 years or even more. Music